Hello, my name is Chris and today I'd like to share with you a few of the things that I learned whilst doing a course to become a certified smoking cessation practitioner with an organisation called the National Centre for Smoking Cessation and Training. This is an organisation based here in the UK and their training is primarily aimed at people working within our National Health Service and within similar public health related organisations. And it teaches, you know, about not just all the stuff that we know about how cigarettes are damaging and what challenges people face, but about how to effectively run one-to-one -one quit smoking support sessions and to put together a smoking cessation program for someone. So I found that really helpful. Um, you know, and even though it's not necessarily aimed at me personally, or you know, the kind of work I normally do, now that I've you know, started to run my own one-to-one -one quit smoking support sessions with people, it's something I wanted to dive back into um, just to increase my knowledge and understanding and gain a bit more confidence in working directly with individual people just on quitting smoking. And to that end, it was successful. I will say that I actually did this course a couple of years ago when I was first starting to write the book, but I kind of did it as a research exercise and I kind of skimmed through it and, and did the test at the end, but didn't really take anything in. It was just kind of, oh, that's interesting, let's move on. But like I said, now that I'm actually working with people and, and helping people individually to quit smoking, I really wanted to, to get into this. And to that end, it was very good for me. The most important thing that I learned wasn't any fact or stacked, or stacked, stat or technique or anything like that. It was simply um, a sense that nothing in this course about quitting smoking contradicted anything that I've said to you in these videos over the years. It was quite reassuring to read things and go, oh yeah, I spoke about that in my depression video. I spoke about that there and this rings a bell, you know. And to be confident that I haven't given you any misinformation or told you anything that is wrong or bad advice. Um, which is good, right? <laughs> um, so what I want to do today is not necessarily to get into, here's all the things where I was proved right, because that doesn't really teach me much. But I want to share with you a few things that stood out to me has been very interesting and share with you my thoughts on them and my reflections and how that influences what I do today. Before I do that, um, just to say thank you so much to everybody who came to hang out with me on the live stream last Saturday. As always, I had a very wonderful time. The next live stream will be Saturday, August the 28th, and I've triple checked the date this time, definitely Saturday, August 28th at 6.30 p.m. UK time. I haven't yet put a link together so that I don't have anything to work and say click this, but I will get a link together and that will be shared in all the usual places. But if you don't want to miss it, put it in your diary, Saturday, August 28th, 6.30 p.m. That's a few weeks from now, right here today, Let's talk about this course that I did. So this course was mainly divided into two key parts. And the first part was all about smoking, about the negative health impact of smoking, the benefits of quitting, who smokes, why they may smoke, and you know the challenges that may stand in people's way of trying to quit. And the second part was all about um, you know, planning a smoking cessation program and how to run these one-to-one -one smoking support sessions. And in the first part of the course, the first thing that really stood out to me was a bunch of numbers. It said that of the people who, you know, 75%, almost three quarters of people who smoke actually have a desire to quit. Yet of them, only one third actually make, a, a, you know, at least a single quit attempt in any given year. And of those people who attempt to quit smoking, only 5% succeed without any support. 
This stood out for me, um, you know, because although on one hand you could say, oh, it's really sad that, you know, only 5% of people manage to quit, it kind of reinforces to me this idea that quitting smoking is not as universally easy as some people say that it is. Yes, there will be people who will find a way to quit smoking and it's a breeze and then they simply can't get that that very same method doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. So it's not always that easy. Not always easy, but it can be done and it's always worth it. And what this really made me reflect on was what's going on for the rest of the people who don't quit. If three quarters of people want to, but only one third actually make an attempt, what's holding the other two thirds of people back? Is it fear? Is it some kind of concern? Of those people who make the attempt to quit, what's holding them, them back from being successful? And I think if we could dive more into this, we could figure out what holds people back and then find a way to help those people who do have a desire to smoke to actually get started on their journey. So maybe this is something I put over to you. What held you back? What is currently holding you back? And what kind of help or information might you need to help you stop that and to help you actually get started on your journey? What was interesting to note was that it didn't just say 5% of people succeed, it said only 5% of people succeed without support, which is why it then goes in to promote the benefits of offering support. Now there is a part of me that thinks, well yeah, this course is going to be a little bit biased because it's all about providing support. But I can, I can, you know, I can see how that definitely makes sense. And what the course says is that the most effective way of quitting smoking is a combination of one-to-one -one support and medication, nicotine replacement therapy or varenkaline, you know, Champix or Chantix. And this is where I start to differ a little bit from the course. I have absolutely no problem with nicotine replacement therapy and I have absolutely no problem with people using Champix or Chantix if you're in the United States. You know, I used that myself. It wasn't entirely successful, but I gave it a try. And I think nicotine replacement therapy in particular can be useful for helping us to first get through the psychological aspect of living life without cigarettes before tackling the nicotine addiction, breaking them up so we don't have to do it all at once. But I absolutely totally understand that nicotine replacement therapy and medication is not for everyone and some people have very good reasons why they don't want to go down that route. And I think those people, you know, you in particular, are still very much worthy of being helped, of being supported and not only that but are still very much capable of achieving your quit. You know, like I said, what works for me may not work for you, which, you know, no method of quitting smoking on the planet has a 100% success rate. If it did, I wouldn't need to do this. Alan Carr wouldn't have needed to write that book. Other people wouldn't have needed to do all of the things they do because there'd just be one universally accepted method that always works and we'd all just do it. But it's not that simple. So going forward, I will continue to support people, you know, whether it's through one-to-one -one sessions or through my video or in Finding Freedom, I will continue to support people who want to use patches just as much as I will continue to root and support those people who just want to go it alone. Because I think it's very important that we find our own method. But I am convinced now, having you know done this kind of thing for a while, that any kind of support, whether it's a video, a one-to-one -one chat, the Facebook group, the live hangout, can be beneficial. And I'm definitely pursuing that more 
because I've seen that it can be helpful. One interesting thing that came up around gender, and this is going to sound like a big generalisation, and it most likely is, but it just made me think a little bit. It said that although more teenage girls smoke than teenage boys, by the time we reach adulthood it tends to be more men than women smoke. And the course addressed this misconception, which actually I'd never heard of, that women can find it harder to quit smoking than men. And he said this is actually not true, but what's going on is that more women are more likely to access quit smoking support services, more, li more women are more, I'm not sure if this is very good English or not, but more women are more likely to reach out and ask for help with their quit the men are, you know, and, and this kind of resonated with, with my YouTube channel. And again, this is such a huge generalization, but I have noticed that I tend to hear more from women than I do from men. And that's absolutely not a problem. I don't care if you're a man or, or a woman or neither or both or, you know, I, I care about you as the individual person, but it does interest me you know, is there that thing that we see in, you know, I've seen it in counselling and hypnotherapy and so many other therapies and support that men do have a hard time sometimes asking for help, you know, and being able to admit, you know, some level of vulnerability. And although I don't have any answers, I do kind of wonder, you know, is there anything that can we can do about that, you know, or is it just going to be one of those facts that remains unchangeable. On to the scary stuff. Talking about the negative health ben impact. I always want to say the negative health benefits, but there's no such thing as a negative benefit. The negative health impact of smoking. And it said that in England alone, and I had to write this figure down on my phone, 77,800 deaths per year are directly related to smoking, and that figure is five million worldwide. In the course, there was a lot of talk about all the usual things that we know about heart disease and lung cancer, but also how smoking can you know, be related to all kinds of other cancers and illnesses and diseases. Um, you know, like heart attacks and strokes. And I'm going to stop looking at my notes now because that means I'm not paying attention. Um, and this information, it's not new. You know, we kind of all know that smoking is bad for us and will kill us and is destroying our bodies. But it is useful to know. I don't think, you know, I can't remember if it was in Alan Carr or some month, something else that I read, but people don't smoke for the same reasons that they quit. Nobody is deliberately smoking to give themselves lung cancer or heart disease or anything like that. So although it's good to know and keep in mind, that knowledge alone isn't necessarily enough to, to scare us into a quit. And I actually don't believe in trying to scare people to quit smoking. I don't believe it's very effective because I believe that if you're scared, then you're probably more likely to go and smoke even more. Because that's just, it's stressful to think about death and disease. And what happens when we get stressed? Well, if we smoke, then we go and smoke even more. It's why on this channel, I don't tend to come on here and say, hey, if you smoke, you will die. I would much rather say to you, yes, that's true, but it's also true that if you quit, you will live. And you will live quite probably in a way that you have never lived before. That there is good things about quitting smoking and being a non-smoker. It's not just about not dying, it's about starting to live and embrace our freedom and our health and our happiness. Having said all of that, it is worth keeping in mind all of the negative things that smoking does to our body because it can help us to get down to the root cause of why we smoke in the first place. What is going on for me? And why do I hate myself so much that I would deliberately choke 
and poison and drive myself further to an early grave? And what can I do to develop self-esteem and a nice sense of respect and love and compassion for my body so that I actually want to take care of it? And when I'm actually wanting to take care of my body and be healthy, well, the first thing I'm going to do then is to stop smoking. There was lots of other stuff around health, um, you know, impacts and things like the way smoking affected pregnancy, which to me seems like if I ever talk about that, it's going to be an entirely different video. And the way that smoking impacts mental health, things like uh, anxiety and depression, and even people with um, things like schizophrenia. And again, what was really reassuring is that I just recently made those videos on depression and there was nothing in there that, that made me think, oh, I got that wrong or I need to go and make a clarification. It all made sense and it all was very much on par with what I've said in the past. The one thing that I did pick up was talking about um, medication. And and I'm going to pause the video and start again because I've forgotten exactly how I was going to word this. Okay. I wrote that much stuff down for this video, I can't remember what I was supposed to say next. Um, so what I was talking about was the subject of, of medications for things like depression and anxiety and, and all the rest of it. And how smoking actually impacts the way those drugs affect our bodies. It was saying that there is a hydrocarbon agent in cigarette smoke which stimulates a liver enzyme responsible for, for met, metabolizing drugs in the body. I have such a hard time with that word. A liver enzyme responsible for metabolizing drugs in the body. And what this means is that some medications such as antipsychotics, antidepressants and anxiolytics um, are cleared faster in the body than if we didn't smoke. And therefore, uh, they don't have the same impact on us as they would on a non-smoker. What that means is that if we are on these medications and smoking, we may need a higher dose than somebody who doesn't smoke in order to get the same effect. And what it was saying, the reason it was saying this was to say to us, you know, if you are on these drugs and you quit smoking, you may then need to see a doctor about getting a lower dose. And I think that's actually good news for us because I don't think anybody necessarily wants to be on high doses of antidepressants. In fact, I'm pretty sure most of us would prefer not to be on them at all. Um, you know, so it's good news that if we quit smoking, we may be able to lower our dose. And then as a result, we may very well be able to, in time, if it is the right thing to do, be at a point where we don't need them at all. But, you know, again, that's a personal decision. A section of the course that was really interesting for me was around um, smoking and alcohol dependence as well as dependence on other drugs. And again, to go a little bit into the scary stuff, it said that smoking worsens diseases related to alcohol misuse. So liver disease and oral cancers and things like that. But again, well, it's important to know this. I don't think anybody is deliberately drinking and smoking to give themselves liver disease. And I don't think that knowledge is always enough, but it's useful to know. And it also taught that people who are dependent on drugs and alcohol may find it harder to quit smoking because the stimulant in drugs or the depressant in alcohol actually lowers our inhibitions and lowers our ability to um, control our impulses, which just absolutely makes sense, doesn't it? If you think about the amount of people who say, I don't smoke, but then I had a drink and then I had a couple of cigarettes. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. The good news was it was saying that, you know, quitting smoking does not, is unlikely to re lead to a relapse of, of drugs or alcohol. So if you're sober and you quit, it's very unlikely to make you want to go and start smoking again. There was so much more in this course about the health and the medical impact of smoking. But honestly, I'm trying to make sure that this video doesn't run to like four hours in length. So I'm going to skip most of that for now and talk a little bit 
about the other side of the course, which is about running these one-to-one -one support sessions and doing smoking cessation programs. Um, again, it stressed the importance of support and what a big difference it can play and how the most effective method is combining smoke with med uh, combining smoke combining support with medita uh, medication come on Chris this em emphasis on how useful support can be is the main reason why I really wanted to start working with people in a one-to-one -one capacity because then you know like I said if qu everyone's quit is different I can help people better than I can with some of the generalizations that I have to do in these videos. It's also, you know, why I do the live stream, you know, and especially our Finding Freedom group, because I think in the absence of any other support, having this amazing community around us of people who know exactly what we're going through and have been through it themselves can be incredibly good. I might as well tell you now, uh, our Finding Freedom group is facebook.com slash groups slash finding freedom one and you know in terms of the medication and the nicotine replacement therapy again I'll say why I understand that it can be helpful for some people that's not going to be something that I ever force on anybody I will absolutely put it on the table and say here is an option that we could try or that you could try but I'm never going to say to anyone unless you take patches or champix you know you're screwed because you're not you know like i said before you have my full support either way but i will definitely do offer this support you know and it said that one of the main benefits of working with people is that it can help them to develop and maintain their motivation for a quit as well as helping them to develop the skills and strategies that they need you know, for when times get tough and challenges come their way, which is something that I always try to do on this channel anyway. And on the subject of motivation, it was saying about using carbon monoxide testing and lung capacity testing as a way of, you know, keeping people motivated. And from personal experience, I can say, you know, yeah, that was definitely something that helped me. You know, I made the video ages ago that when I was smoking, they said I had the lung capacity of a 50-something year old man. And then when I quit smoking, that went down to like a, the lung capacity of a 34, 35 year old man, which is way better, right? It's got to be way better. The main thing I've learned about this from this course about how to um, do these sessions, however, was about adding some kind of structure to a series of quit smoking sessions. And since I started doing these, I've been very flexible and kind of mainly drawing on my counseling training where you kind of meet people where they're at at that moment in face to face with you. So even though we may have been talking about one thing last week, a person's needs may change the following week. And I think there is something to be said for being flexible and meeting people where they are but I also think if I'm going to offer people actual practical help, then there does need to be some kind of structure in place. And this course was saying about how, you know, it's recommended to offer at least one session while the person is still smoking, maybe two in which they can set a quit date and plan for anything that they may need to do in order to make that quit date successful. Whether that's getting NRT or just stocking up on fresh fruits and vegetables or planning a day off or working out triggers or anything like that. Then they said you do another session on the quit date so that you can really you know help the person get the motivation up and make that quit stick. And then to do two, three, four sessions, as many as the person may need, well they said like four but I'm going to say as many as you need, um, you know, to tackle those first really tough weeks and get through it. Of course, I'm never going to turn anybody away if they want to come to me at a different stage of their quit or just have a one-off session for one particular issue, but it did give me the confidence to recommend an actual structured program 
and to put things in place and go, okay, this week we do this, this week we do this, you know, whilst still being flexible to each person's individual needs. I could go on and on and on. There was so much more stuff uh, in this course. It repeated things like, you know, the, the not one puff ever rule, which you see all the time, you know, and more things on actual what to say and how to help people with relapses. But I think I've covered the main points and the main stuff that I learned from it. Honestly, the main aim of this video was just to help me figure out what I've learned and tell you some interesting stuff. But if you are watching this and you have decided, you know, I would actually like to work with you, Chris, then I would love to hear from you. The best way to approach me about one-to-one um, -one smoking sessions is to email me at my hypnotherapy practice, which is chris at cjstherapy.com. I will say that the smoking support sessions and hypnotherapy are two different things. It's just that I'm doing everything through my practice these days. So that's chris at cjstherapy.com. Of course, there is my book. It is called Quit Smoking and Be Happy, available in print and ebook form from amazon.com. If you have enjoyed the book, please leave a review on Amazon. I'd love to hear what you think. And finally, yes, we have our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash finding freedom. One, this amazing community who really helped me this week. I've had a challenging week and I'm so grateful to all of you for supporting me. You know, it really, this stuff really is excellent. So thank you so much for watching today. I will see you next time. Bye.